So with that, I'm really excited to introduce our next, our first speaker today, Darlene Heyman. She's going to be talking about test screenings, how moviegoers shape the films we love. Um, Darlene is a well-respected market research analyst specializing in the motion picture category. She's an expert in evaluating test audience data and uncovering insights to help filmmakers and studios understand moviegoers' reactions to their films. She's earned a reputation for distilling this research into succinct conclusions that can be used to refine movies during the final stages of post-production. She co-authored a book called Audienceology, How Moviegoers Shape the Films We Love, which was published in 2021. And it's the basis for her discussion with us today. She was born and raised in New Jersey. She's a graduate of Farley, Fairley, Fairley Dickinson University, spent her adult life in Los Angeles, working first in advertising, uh, transitioning into market research, uh, and currently works for Screen Engine ASI, the leader in entertainment research, conducting studies for all the major studios, including Disney, Warner Brothers, Paramount, Universal, Sony, and streaming services, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Apple TV, and I'm proud to say she's a neighbor of mine in Tarzana um, with her husband, Steve, who's here today. So Darlene, thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited about learning about the work you do. Thank you, Joel, for that nice introduction. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming out to this. Um, hello to those of you who are on the YouTube channel. Um, yeah, I've been doing this for about 20 years. You might be interested to know that just about every movie coming out of Hollywood is put through this process. It's an early read on what moviegoers think about their film and how they're going to speak about it with their friends. Um, <clears throat> the movie industry takes these tests very seriously because they know the ticket buying public determines whether a movie is going to be a blockbuster or a bomb. So our opinions matter. These are just a few of the movies that we've tested in the past year or two. Um, I'm kind of interested, has anybody here ever participated in test screening? Okay, so we have quite a few. So you know something about the process. Um, what I'm going to try to do today is reveal a little more about what happens behind the scenes um, and share some stories, hopefully that'll keep you entertained, about movies that were impacted by audience feedback. Test previews are nothing new. Um, they've been around since the beginning of the movie industry. They are conducted after the film is assembled, but before it's locked. We recruit an audience of regular moviegoers to watch the film and then complete surveys. Their answers are collected, tabulated, and analyzed. That's where I come in. I, uh, I get all that data and I distill it into a report that the studio uses. It, the report highlights things that are working really well and areas that might be re-examined to make the film play even better. And typically, we conduct a focus group right after the screening. We keep about 20 people in the theater so that they can talk about what they've just seen. From the earliest days of silent film, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd, and Charlie Chaplin would often preview bits and pieces of their upcoming movies to see how their jokes landed. These were veterans of vaudeville. They knew the, the importance of getting a crowd behind their film and the timing of, of uh, their jokes. So after they completed a sequence, they would take it up into one of the big movie palaces up on Hollywood Boulevard and ask the manager to play it after the feature film ended. Then they would stand in the back and listen for the laughter to see if they were on the right track. Harold Lloyd actually plotted the timing and intensity of audience laughter on huge graphs that he'd take back to his studio and use to recut his film. For his um, film, The Navigator, Buster Keaton um, 
filmed an entire elaborate underwater scene in which he played a traffic cop directing schools of fish. It was quite a, a feat for 1924. And when he took it into a theater and had it um, played for a test audience, they were so flabbergasted, they forgot to laugh. And he scrapped the whole thing. By the early 1930s, the testing of comedy sequences gave way to entire movies being previewed. There's the famous story of Gone with the Wind. Margaret Mitchell's book had been a huge success. So when the movie was finished under great secrecy, secrecy David O. Selznick brought it out to Riverside to the Fox Theater. The audience had come to see Gary Cooper in Beau Gest. And after that was over, they announced that a second movie would be played, but they didn't tell them the title. They only said, if you want to stay, you're welcome to stay, but if you leave, there will be no readmittance. Doors to the theater closed, the lights went down, and when Gone with the Wind came up on the screen, the audience almost fell out of their seats. They hardly moved for the nearly four-hour movie, and at the end of it, they wrote on their comment cards, please don't cut a single frame. <clears throat> This is what the original surveys looked like. They were postcard sized. They only asked a couple of questions. And moviegoers would actually pick them up in the theater on their way out, take them home, fill them out, and mail them back to the studio using their own stamps. To this day, they're still called cards. But this is what they look like. They're still printed on card stock, but they're eight and a half by 11. Um, there are about two dozen questions. Um, we ask, how would you rate the film? Would you recommend it to others? And then there's a whole battery of questions that asks what they thought about the characters, the relationships, elements like the story, the beginning, the ending, <clears throat> the action, the comedy, the romance, the scares, the music soundtrack. And then there are questions about pacing and confusion. It takes about a half an hour to fill them out, and it's done right in their seats immediately following the movie. They don't take them home. In recent years, we've migrated to digital surveys. We actually hand out little handheld devices that look like cell phones, and the survey is loaded on that. And it is a blessing for me because I don't have to read bad handwriting. And even misspelled words are a little bit easier to decipher. And the, the beauty of it is that all of those answers are uploaded onto a secure site so that they're, the, the, um, they're processed overnight. Uh, a typical screening starts at 7 o'clock, and by the time it's over, the surveys are filled out, the focus group, I probably leave the theater around 10 or 10.30. And all of the data is processed overnight. We have a team of people who work the night shift, and by 6, 6.30 the next morning, I have everything, including copies of all the surveys. So it's really, you know, quite, it's, it's fabulous that we can do this all digitally now. We love the technology. By the mid-70s, several changes to the movie business catapulted the um, widespread use, catapulted test screenings into widespread use. First, filmmakers started using expensive special effects, which drove up production costs. Then studios started to release more of the movies nationally, which required more prints and drove up the, the cost of distribution. And then network television was used to support these national openings, which drove, drove up the marketing costs. So, so the, the stakes got higher and studios wanted to make sure that the movie worked before they invested all that money in it. A good example of a film from that era that benefited from the test screening process is Jaws. In 1973, producing partners Richard Zanuck and David Brown purchased the rights to, to the book. It was a daring move because Peter Benchley was a first time novelist. Um, but the Zanuck and Brown thought the, the story was terrific, that it would translate well onto the big screen and they had a deal to make it with MCA Universal. They, the studio um, and the producers worked with Doubleday to develop this cover art. This is the, the hard copy here. Um, and they were going to carry through that imagery into the marketing materials for the film. 
by the time the movie was released, I, I'm sorry, the, the book, let's talk about the, the book. The book came out in February of 1974, and it flew off the shelves. During the, that summer, it, it, it kept people riveted, beachgoers riveted to their blankets, too afraid to go into the water. By the time the film was ready to be released, this was the cover art that was on the paperback. Um, and this is what this was is actually what the movie poster looked like. The shark now had the sharp white teeth, and the swimmer was now naked, and it was very provocative. Um, the the studio organized a test screening in Dallas, and the executives and the filmmakers flew in for that. Everybody was extremely nervous. Um, the director was a 28-year-old Steven Spielberg, and he was a virtual unknown. Production had been difficult. The mechanical shark, which the crew nicknamed Bruce, hardly ever worked. And when it did, everyone on set would burst out laughing because it looked so fake and ridiculous. So they didn't know, would, this, would the monster be scary enough? I mean, would, would the audience believe it or would they say, ah, it's a big rubber dummy? Um, so at, in Dallas, the theater was packed, the lights went down. And when the shark was first revealed, and Roy Scheider delivered that famous line, you're going to need a bigger boat, the Dallas test audience never even heard it. The theater erupted in screams and completely obliterated the dialogue. Everybody was thrilled. The filmmakers were, were fr thrilled. But Steven Spielberg, being the perfectionist that he is, still wanted to make one change. There was a scene where Richard Dreyfus dives down into the ocean at night to investigate uh, a sunken fishing boat. Um, they wanted to see what had happened to its cabin. And in the theater, it, it got an okay response, but Spielberg thought it should have been a bigger scale. So when they got back to LA, he wanted to do a reshoot. And he asked his editor, Verna Fields, if he could use her backyard pool to shoot it in order to keep the cost down. She actually lived right here in Encino. Um, so on, on the, the night of the, screen, of the reshoot, as the sun is setting, the crew is around the pool, they lower the prop boat into the deep end, and they pour a gallon of milk in to make the water look just murky enough to resemble Nantucket Sound. And then Richard Dreyfus goes into the water. And this is a little clip of the scene that they reshot. I know it's dark, and we don't have sound, I don't think. Oh, our sound isn't working. I don't know if you can see, but... Basically what that was, the, the, the captain, the dead captain's corpse flo floats into view as he shines a light into this ripped open hull and one eye is bulging in deathly terror and the other eye is missing altogether and a crab crawls out of the eye socket. So that was basically it. The, the, the scene was put into the, the new version of the movie and they took it to uh, test in Long Beach, and the reaction, especially during that scene, was just thunderous. So they got their validation. The shark was terrifying, and Jaws set a new standard for scary movies. It stayed in theaters for the entire summer of 1975 as the number one picture, and it's considered the first summer blockbuster and a prelude to what we now call tentpole movies, those big money makers that support a studio's entire annual slate of films. Let's talk about a more recent movie, La La Land. This is Damien Chazelle's Ode to Los Angeles. Um, it was tested in Pasadena in 2016, and it was one of those rare pictures that came out of post-production, almost fully polished. In the original cut that we tested, the beginning introduced Ryan Gosling's character fiddling with a, a tape deck in his car and Emma Stone's character rehearsing for an audition. 
No one sang and no one danced until 12 minutes into the movie when her roommates try to convince Emma Stone's character to join them for a night out. The girls suddenly break into song and dance, but the rules of the movie hadn't been set up. So the audience was distracted and confused. They're like, wait, what are we watching here? Interestingly enough, there had been a, a big musical number that had been produced. It was originally called Traffic. Eventually, it was called Another Day in the Sun. But the filmmakers realized they needed an overture to kind of set up what this movie was about. They had shelved the, the, this sequence because they weren't quite sure where it fit into the movie. They weren't convinced that it stylistically belonged within the storyline, and it didn't feature the two stars. So they, they thought, maybe we'll just use it over the end credits. But after that first test screening, they knew where it needed to go, and they put it on the front of the movie. Um, this is, the, the song is like, four minutes long. This is just the last few seconds so that you can see how it was used as an overture. Let me see if I can find it. Camera pans down, Ryan Gosling's in his car fiddling with the tape deck, and the rest is history. Um, the, the test screening helped the filmmakers understand that they needed to set up the audience so that they were prepared for what they would see. And La La Land, you know, was, was really a huge success. It grossed almost a half a billion dollars worldwide. It won six Oscars, including for original score, original song, uh, cinematography, pr production design, best director, Damien Chazelle, and best actress in a leading role for Emma Stone. <clears throat> Thought I'd spend a couple minutes just talking about how we recruit for a, a test audience. Um, it's done by specific gra uh, demographics. It's mostly online, kind of like an evite. Um, we have an extensive database with hundreds of thousands of names of people who have agreed to attend and participate. So we can mine that database and find those who live near a theater where the, the test is being conducted. And then we also can select by gender, age, education, parental status, the ages of their children if it's a family movie. Sometimes we augment that with field intercepts. Those are the people who stand outside a theater with a clipboard and say, do you want to come to a free movie on Thursday night? Less and less of that is done, though. It's mostly done online. And it usually includes a recruit statement, a, a little description of the movie to you know, attract them to the screening, and a movie qualifier list. This is an example of a recruit paragraph. This film tells the true story of an unlikely friendship between Tony Lip, an Italian-American bouncer with a seventh grade education, and Dr. Don Shirley, a world-class pianist on a con um, who is African-American. In 1962, Tony is hired to drive Dr. Shirley on a concert tour from New York City through the pre-civil rights era Deep South. Confronted with racism, danger, and sometimes unexpected humanity and humor, the men are forced to set aside their differences to work together, and in the process, embark on the journey of a lifetime. The movie stars Academy Award winner Mahershala Ali, Academy Award nominee Viggo Mortensen, and Linda Cardellini. It's directed by Peter Farrelly, it has not yet been rated, but is expected to be PG-13. Does anybody remember which th what it is? Green Book. Green Book, right. And then anyone who accepts an invitation must also have, oh, sorry, they, oh, must also um, have seen and enjoyed at least two of the movies on this list. All of these films um, touch on similar themes of bigotry, racism, pairings of two very different characters, unlikely friendships. And the reason we do that 
is to make sure that we don't have genre rejectors show up. We don't want people to say, I didn't rate the movie you know, highly because it's not my cup of tea. I don't like these types of movies. We're trying to get an audience in that would actually potentially buy a ticket to see the movie when it comes out. Sometimes we have a blind recruit, and that basically tells people nothing about the movie. You and your guest are invited to see an upcoming all new major live action movie from Walt Disney Pictures. Usually it, it says from a major Hollywood studio coming to theaters. And this, this was actually for the 2023 The Little Mermaid movie. And you can see all similar films. Why do we do a blind recruit? Well, for security reasons, to minimize risk of word getting out ahead of the film's release. It's done especially for high profile movies that might attract reviewers who sneak into the screening to get an early look at it. Um, and it, we, we do it a lot, quite often for franchises and sequels to prevent an audience full of fans who are going to skew the results. For, um, like superhero movies, we hardly ever tell them what it is. We always do it blind. Every once in a while, we have the occasional bait and switch um, where the description of one movie is, is used to bring the audience in, but then when they get there, a different movie is shown. This, um, this is an example of how that can backfire. In 1995, I believe, Walt Disney Pictures had two, movie, uh, two movies coming out, both that were going to attract a family audience. One was Operation Dumbo Drop. It was about um, a U.S. Army unit um, during the Vietnam War who was charged with bringing a live elephant into a little village to curry favor with the villagers. And... Um, the second movie that they had coming out had been developed under great secrecy. Great secrecy. There was no word at all about it. So the audience is brought in. They think they're going to see Operation Dumbo Drop. And the trailer had already launched. So there was a lot of excitement and enthusiasm to see it. Well, when the actual movie that was being tested was shown, Toy Story, and nobody had ever heard of that, there were groans and People walked out of the theater, and today we look back and we say, oh my gosh, those people had a glimpse of movie history. I mean, Toy Story changed animation for everything that came after it. It was the, the first uh, computer-generated computer, computer generated film, and, you know, huge. It spawned uh, an entire uh, franchise. But those people were just so disappointed that they weren't going to get to see Ray Liotta and, a, and an elephant. Um, getting to another story about a movie that changed, um, The Martian was first tested in Aliso Viejo in 2015. It played extremely well except for the conclusion. When all was said and done, the test audience did not feel emotionally satisfied. In that first cut, the picture ended when Matt Damon's character is saved after a harrowing sequence in which he launches through space to connect with the, the, the ship that's come to rescue him. He's brought on board, and the movie just ended. Well, the audience wanted to see him back on Earth. They wanted to know that he was okay. He made it back. So Ridley Scott, the director, went to 20th Century Fox and got money to shoot an epilogue. Now, that's not a bit uh, an easy ask. Studios don't just pony up more money, but it was Ridley Scott um, of Thelma and Louise fame, Alien, Gladiator, Black Hawk Down, and given his track record, the studio gave him what he wanted. So in the next version that we tested, Matt Damon's character is back on Earth and teaching a class at NASA. We see him sitting outside on a, on a bench outside the building, and he's drinking a cup of coffee, and then he glances down, and he sees a, a plant, a little weed growing between his feet through the gravel. And there's no dialogue, but you know what he's thinking. You know that he's thinking, well, what a miracle it is that this little weed can just pop up here on Earth when it took me months and months 
to grow a food source for my survival on, Mar on Mars. Then you see a bunch of cadets, you know, jogging past him, and then it transitions into the, the lecture hall where he's teaching his class. We tested it again, voila, huge improvement in the, in the uh, audience response. I think it went on to do like $600 million. So uh, the studio was very happy that they had given Ridley Scott what he wanted. Um, logistics of a test preview. Uh, people I work with often say that it's, it's like uh, putting on a wedding or something. It's, you know, we send out all these invitations, but we never know on the night of the screening who's actually going to show up at the theater. It's always, it's always a little bit of a crapshoot. Um, I think we need about a thousand RSVPs, people saying that they're actually going to come to get 300 to, to show up. And that's because, I mean, think of, think of our lives. You know, it's, uh, the screening starts at 7 o'clock. There's traffic. It's raining. The babysitter doesn't show up. You have to work late. So we, we just never really know what we're going to get until we get to the theater. Once we're there, we have to balance the audience. If the um, studio wants 50% men and 50% women, but the line outside the theater is mostly women, we are scrambling to find every man we can to get him into the theater. Um, then we... Uh, we check IDs, we actually take pictures of everybody's licenses, we have them sign non-disclosure agreements. There's no talking about, texting about, tweeting or Xing or whatever they call it these days, blogging, until the movie is released. There's security inside the theater, no cell phones are allowed. If someone comes in with a cell phone, we have to bag it and tag it and hold it at a table outside the, uh, the, the uh, auditorium. Then there's wrangling talent. Some of these directors are recognizable now, and many of the big stars are producers on their movies, and they want to see, they want to see their picture with a, an audience, so they come as well. We have to tape off seats for them, keep them hidden away in a back room in the theater somewhere, and then under the cover of darkness, whisk them in and get them seated so that they can watch the movie with the audience. We have to start on time. People wait an hour. Those of you who have, who have participated in a test screening know you line up an hour before. So people get antsy if we don't start on time. And after it's over, we distribute and collect the surveys or the handheld devices. We've got to go through the audience and select the 20 people who are invited to stay behind for the focus group. And then at the end of the night, we present a top line to the, the, the filmmakers and studio executives that are there. It summarizes the first two questions on the, the, the survey. So we have an entire crew of people, after those surveys are collected, they're up in a back room somewhere, literally counting answers to how would you rate the movie, excellent, very good, good, fair, or poor, and would you recommend it to others? Yes, definitely, yes, probably, no, probably not, no, definitely not. And we, we have a little chart that we print out on paper and we hand out to the filmmakers and to the studio executives at the end of the night. All of this is, I mean, doing it all, as I said, it is like putting on a huge event. And by the end of the night, our staff is exhausted and sweaty, but we somehow get through it each time. After the surveys are collected, we have our, our 20 people, uh, we bring them down to the front of the theater and um, we have a moderator-led a moderator -led discussion um, where they, they talk about the film in their own words, their visceral reactions to it. Their opinions are often expressed in very heartfelt ways, what they like, what they don't like, and it's a preamble to what the audience at large thinks. Then the theater clears out. That smell of popcorn that was so delicious at 7 o'clock is now stale. There's litter everywhere, cups and wrappers, and we huddle with the studio executives and the filmmakers, and we hand out that top line, and we discuss what we just heard in the focus group, and emotions can run high. I mean, these people have spent years of their lives getting the film made, 
No one wants to make a bad movie, and there can be terrible disappointment or great elation if, depending on the scores. Um, I've seen it all. I've seen filmmakers with tears in their eyes when they haven't gotten the response that they wanted. Um, there was one, one director a few years ago, I remember, who his film actually tested very well, but we're, we're standing around, we're waiting for the top line, and I, I can see his head tilts back and his eyes are fluttering and I'm thinking, somebody better catch this guy because he's about to faint. But he, he collected himself and he saw the top line and he got the results that he wanted and there's congratulations. I mean, literally, I think, I think they think that their careers um, are, are determined by how well their movies test and that, you know, they'll never work in this town again if they don't test well, but they'll go on to have huge careers if it does test well. So it's important to keep the discussion afterward on an even keel to encourage them to read through the surveys and, and digest what they learn. There is always something good that can come out of a test screening. There are other types of changes that can happen based on test previews. Um, there was a movie based on a book called Shoeless Joe. That was the title of the movie. And it was tested many times. And every time it was tested, people just loved the film and hated the title. They thought it sounded like a, a movie about a hobo and not a, a, a touching story about an Iowa farmer who builds a baseball diamond in his cornfield. So the studio goes to the director and producer. They have a meeting in the executive dining room. I believe this was also up at Universal. And they say, the audiences love your movie, but we got to change the title. Well, the, the producer was so irate, he got up and he threw his chair across the dining room and he said, you cannot change the title, it's the title of the book, you're going to bastardize the movie, and the author is going to be very upset. Well, somebody picks up the phone and calls the author, and the author says, I never liked the title, Shoeless Joe. I wanted to call my book The Dream Field, but my editor wanted to call it Shoeless Joe. At which point, everybody agreed that Field of Dreams was just a perfect title for the movie. Insights from my years of experience. What drives test scores down? Slow pacing, number one. Inauthentic dialogue or, or situations, stuff that's not believable. Confusions or unresolved story points. An emotionally unsatisfying ending like we saw with The Martian and an unlikable protagonist. The audience wants to invest in the protagonist, even if the character is flawed. I mean, it could be a villain that you love to hate, like in Despicable Me, but you have to invest in the protagonist. What drives test scores up? A big laugh at the end, a big scare at the end, a blooper reel for comedies, an unforeseen twist or surprise. I've seen this over and over again. You know, a movie that Definitely has some problems, but then if you deliver that unexpected twist, all is forgiven. Great music cues, a great soundtrack, and a well-crafted epilogue, especially for um, a movie based on a true story. The audience always wants to know, well, what happened to the real people? And if you can show them pictures or uh, video of the real people, they just eat it up. So that's my story. If there's any questions, I'd love to answer them. Yes. Um, the question is, how do I, how do I, how do we select the test cities? Um, about 75 percent of all test screenings are conducted right here in California, right here in Southern California, because um, studio executives don't want to spend time traveling. But we, we test the theater depending on the demographics that we're looking for. So if, we're, if we want a family audience, we might go out to Thousand Oaks. If we want um, a heavily African-American audience, 
we go to the theater at the Howard Hughes Center or Baldwin Hills. Um, if we want an audience of highly educated people, we used to go to the West Side Pavilion, but that's closed. But we, we would go to maybe the Regal and Sherman Oaks. So mm -hmm. it, it's really th through discussion with the studio on who they anticipate the audience will be. Yeah, when you ask how many of us um, had been had been involved in this process, I don't know. Maybe I wasn't able to get it. I wasn't able to get a good about view. About a half dozen. About right, a half dozen. Right, right. Uh -huh. Which is a very small number. And my experience has been at the ArcLight when it was in Sherman Oaks, and this is probably over ten years ago, when my husband and I were exiting. I would see somebody with a clipboard. But we noticed that we were never approached because of our age group. It was mainly the younger. And I understand that advertisers target the 18 to 49. So my question to you is, currently, since you do it online, are you excluding us? No. Um, <laughs> you know, we do, we do not exclude people our age. Um, but I'll tell you why studios are hesitant it's because we don't go out on opening weekend. And, and that really determines, I mean, we, we still go to movies, but older people are less likely to turn out on the first weekend because it's crowded, whatever. And so, and that's not for all movies. I mean, there's, there's many movies where we do want an older audience. Um, but, but yeah, I, I feel your pain. <laughs> they don't want me either. <laughs> Do the studios pay for your services? And oh, how yes. do and how do you how do you choose which ones you're going to make your contract with? We work with all of them actually. Um, we work with all of the major studios, all of the streaming services, many independent production uh, houses, and they pay tens of thousands of dollars for a single screening. And many, many movies are screened more than once. They're tested more than once. Do you um, do screenings for independent films or only for studio films? Absolutely for independent films. But again, because the cost is quite high, uh, the independent companies may do them less often or maybe only do one or two for their films, but yes, we work with all the, the indies too, the major independents, yes. Uh, you, you gave some great examples of rewrites and new endings and stuff like that. What film had to have the most significant changes from you know before the audience review to, the, to after the audience review? Oh, that's a tough question, because so many of them have undergone you know, major uh, changes. I would say, in general, comedies undergo the most changes. Um, most of the big comedy directors, like Sasha Baron Cohen and Judd Apatow, will make their movies. They'll fill their movies with lots of jokes and then just cut back the ones that don't work. Um, so I would say, for like a Borat or you know movies like that, they have lots and lots of jokes. Um, and some are on the editing floor, and sometimes the actors ad lib, and they'll kind of introduce those jokes in to see which ones land. Sort of a song along the same line. Have you reviewed any films that tested well, but then flopped? All the time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's so awful. The testing of a movie, just because it tests well, does not mean that it's going to be a box office success. Um, Can you give some examples? Well, I worked on a movie, um, I'm trying to remember what it was called, but it was, um, I think it was a Truman Capote movie, and almost the exact same movie was made a second time, and nobody wanted to see the second one, even though it tested brilliantly. Yeah. 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 So can you, I, I'm, I'm always interested in the anecdotes, the, the stories of, you know, uh, ex example where you couldn't convince the director or producer uh. to make a change that you knew based on the testing would make the film better. 
Well, I have to be careful because we, we do everything under complete secrecy. But there was a movie that was released, I think on Netflix, um, called I Want to Dance with Somebody. It was a Whitney Houston movie. And we tried to convince the filmmaker to add some footage of the real Whitney Houston at the end of the movie, and they just refused. And I think that movie would have done much better had they, they done that. Joel, I'm feeling a little lightheaded. Yeah, you are? Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna go sit down, okay? okay. well, we can bring Sorry. up the chair. I'll bring it. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you test foreign movies? Uh, we do, not often, not often, but we do test foreign movies. Um, I just worked on one that was almost entirely in Spanish. And it actually tested quite well, but we had a bilingual audience that didn't necessarily have to read the subtitles. Um, but it's unusual. We don't do many. So why are there still so many bad movies? Oh, that, <laughs> that is a question that I get all the time from my friends. And I'll tell you, um, you know, as I said, no one sets out to make a bad movie. But what happens from script to screen, it, you know, can change a movie altogether. You never really know uh, until it's assembled what you have. And then if there are problems that require reshoots, it's up to the, the, the studio whether or not they want to spend the money. And sometimes they don't. There are also final cut directors like... Um, well, Ridley Scott is one, Ron Howard is one, uh, uh, Clint Eastwood, Woody Allen. They don't have to change their movies because in their contract, they get final cut. And you know what? I just, I just tested a movie um, just maybe two weeks ago that's really good. It plays well, but one of the leads is just miscast. And how do you fix that, you know? It's like... It, if in order to get it up into that top tier, they would have had to have a different actor in that role. They can't cut and, and paste, it, AI, no, AI really. will help. <laughs> it won't, it won't. <laughs> so sometimes there are just flaws in the movie that can't be fixed. Uh, there's a question yeah, there's Eileen. Yeah. Can you talk about the Barbie phenomena? Oh, we did all the test work on Barbie. And again, I have to be careful about what I say. And I personally did not work on it. A different analyst handled it. But I think um, initially they thought it was going to be a movie that appealed to little girls. And they, they didn't realize that it really is quite adult and had a much broader appeal. And I think it just tapped into um, nostalgia. And plus, just looking at it, I mean, I personally didn't love it, but I thought it was just beautifully um, designed, the colors, it was just so unusual, and uh, people just got behind it. Sometimes it's just in the zeitgeist, you know? <laughs> well, and, yeah, three years from now, it may not be so popular, right? That's right, <laughs> that's right. Or you may look back and say, how did we love that movie, you know? What, oh, what about last year's... Uh, Academy Award winner, anything, anywhere, all at once. I mean, explain that movie that to me. That was strange. So I, strange. I didn't get that. It yeah. was really a weird movie. A weird movie. I yeah. wouldn't go see it again. No. You know? <laughs> so what, what is the movie you are most proud that you worked on and, and saw changes and, and felt you had an impact on? Oh, gosh. Um, let me think of some. Well, you know, there was a movie... Um, called The Shape of Water. That was a beautiful movie. And again, they, they didn't make many changes. It was mostly tightening it up in a few places. But I'm so proud to have worked on that movie. I just thought it was so beautiful. And, uh, you know, there's so many of them. You know, I, uh, I did all the testing on Maestro. We were talking about that before we started. And, uh, you know, I think there was an expectation 
that that movie would be about um, Leonard Bernstein's body of work. And after conversations with Bradley Cooper, I think we all realize that that's not the movie he made. He really wanted to make a movie about um, the marriage and this love story between a gay man and the woman he marries who tries to accept him for what he is. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just seeing that movie kind of go through the changes that it went through, it, 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 it's an important movie. Any other questions or comments? Oh, oh yeah. Okay, so so Maestro was uh, was tested first in New York, and after that test, um, we you know I, I wrote a report, and the studio wanted to have a conversation with him to kind of debrief on what we learned from that test screening. And it was done over Zoom. I think he was still in New York. I'm, of course, here in LA. So the, the, the Zoom is set up for 8.30 in the morning. I get up at the crack of dawn. I do hair. I put on makeup. I'm like, oh, I'm going to actually have a Zoom with Bradley Cooper. And uh, the Zoom comes on, and he's in his car. He's on his phone. And he just did the audio. I never even got to see him. <laughs> Then when he came out here, I'll never forget, um, we tested it at the Grove. And when I got to the theater, I was actually running a little late. I think I had been writing a report that day. I was running a little late. I get to the theater, and we have a talent wrangler stationed outside the theater. And she goes, oh, Darlene, go say hello to Bradley Cooper. You know, he's, he's in this little room. And I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm like, you know, too nervous. And uh, she pushes me into the room and opens the door, and there he is, he's just sitting there, and he's, you know, he's got a baseball cap on, and I introduce myself, and I stumble through and tell him how much I loved his movie, and uh, he said, well, thank you very much, Darlene, nice to meet you. <laughs> Change the title. <laughs> yeah. I'm just wondering, do the major studios, when they do this testing, um, I mean, you talk about New York City, Los Angeles. Obviously, we're such a divided country uh, with different ideas what's entertainment. So how do they handle the Midwest, the South, where they're a lot more conservative than the cities or the states on the coast? It's a big concern. That's an excellent question, and it's a big concern. And we, we do a test in Kansas City or Olathe, Kansas, or Dallas, Texas. Sometimes we just go up to Sacramento to get a beat on, you know, what, what happens when we get away from the big cities? Is there an audience for this movie? So we, we definitely do go um, out to... Uh, other cities in those places for exactly that reason, to make sure that it doesn't just play to a liberal La La Land audience. <laughs> Do their opinions also get considered? Absolutely. I mean, for big studio movies, they have to play everywhere. You know, they're nationally released and they want to make sure they play everywhere. I might also mention for the, for the streamers, for Netflix, Amazon, Apple TV, um, even though they are developed for television and many of them never get a theatrical release, we still often test them in a movie theater because we, the filmmaker wants to see how an audience reacts to it. Yeah. Back, back in the day, they used to have a you know, preview house, and they used to have the little dials, and of course, your, what, the data you got was basically your grass and all that. Do they do anything like that some, uh, similarly um, today? With more we do, technology? and the company I work for actually owns the company. That became ASI. Oh, yeah. um, yes, and we, we own that company, and dials are still used but more for TV shows, the, tele the TV show um, uh, testing that we do, um, pilot testing, and, um, and for trailers. And, you know, but yes, people still sit there with dials and, uh, and do that. Actually, there's a funny story in my book. Am I running over time? No, you're fine. <clears throat> there's a funny story in the book um, from Ron Howard when he was a young uh, director when he wanted to make a movie he did this um, kind of a body co 
comedy um, that he did with Roger Corman, who was this B, you know, movie guy who came up with the money for Ron Howard to make his movie. It was called Grand Theft Auto. And when the movie was done, uh, Corman says to Ron Howard, well, Ron, we're going to take it up to Preview House and test it. So Ron Howard gets there, and the audience is filled with older people, our age and older, and they're testing Geritol commercials. And then they're going to test his film. So now he's sweating bullets, and he's thinking, oh, my gosh, you know, the, this is a, you know, kind of a, a, as I said, a body comedy. It's a little off color. And he sits there, and he's so nervous. But you know what? Those little old ladies were laughing. And when he got the results back, he knew exactly what he needed to do with his picture. But, uh, yeah, it's kind of an old-fashioned way to test. But, yes, we still use dials. Yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. Any last questions, comments? Well, Darlene, thank you thank so much. You. We really, thank really you. enjoyed hearing from you.